I will um, talk about uh, the immunoglobulins as a treatment for post polio syndrome and what we know about it at present. I think Professor Boy told you that the Dutch are the largest people in Europe. They're the largest, tallest people in the world. But uh, even taking into account that I'm bringing the average down, of course. Um, let's see. I will s uh, say some words about inflammation, trial research, and a new trial that is at present uh, ongoing and that should give a final answer to the effectiveness. Um, what we know about uh, post polio syndrome is that uh, there is a decline in size of enlarged motor units in time. Um, tomorrow we will talk about research and I will show a little more about that. Uh, but we don't know exactly why it is. In 1981, uh, the hypothesis by Wiegers and Hubble was that it was a sort of metabolic exhaustion of the motor neurons that had to um, maintain these very large motor units. Uh, but uh, how and exactly why, that was not clear. And then later on, uh, Gonzalez and Borg from, from Sweden, from Karolinska, uh, came up with the idea of chronic inflammation and there had been previous reports also giving some uh, uh, indication of uh, inflammation. Um, so there have been uh, immunological studies done uh, that gave evidence of local inflammation and immunological responses in the central nervous system. Here you see the studies uh, also in muscle and also in the vascular system. And also there have been studies that looked at uh, inflammation in the blood and uh, as an expression of systematic uh, immunological activation. And there have been a number of studies there too. Um, and we also did a study in 2014, which I think for, from all the st studies, the broadest panel of uh, inflammatory markers and uh, it's absolutely clear that there is a systematic chronic inflammation. But there's a lot of differences between all these studies and how they were performed. The question is, of course, does this uh, inflammation have a relation with post uh, sim syndrome symptoms? and it has uh, been uh, associated with pain and with self-reported physical functioning and not with other uh, symptoms like fatigue, muscle strength or walking capacity. But that is of course a measurement at a fixed point in time. And as we, for instance, all know that muscle strength has a large variability between um, individuals. It's very unlikely that you would find a relation between some immunological parameters and uh, the severity of muscle weakness because it's largely determined by the severity of the, poli the initial polio affection. We very recently reported a study where we looked at the progression of muscle weakness over a period of 10 years in relation whether or not there would be any association with uh, immunological markers, and we looked at it in different ways, but we did not find a relation. Now that is not necessarily conclusive that, there, that it has no influence, uh, but um, we were very interested in whether or not we would find it. But we only measured, of course, these uh, TNF alpha, for instance, at the end of the 10 year period and not in between. And uh, I think there's, m and we had about a uh, little more than 40 patients, so not a very big sample too, but it's, uh, we could not, we were very um, eager to know whether there would be a relation, but we could not confirm it at that uh, moment. Um, the uh, intravenous immunoglobulins, uh, what is it? These are uh, antibodies that have been purified from blood and are given by infusion um, over to the patient. Um, 
and this is a very important uh, uh, paper which was published in 2004 where they showed that immunoglobulins reduced the inflammatory markers in the central nervous system. And here you see uh, for TNF-alpha and interferon gamma uh, levels in the CNS, they were elevated in comparison with other individuals with other non-inflammatory neurological diseases, and they were elevated, not elevated in the control group. And here you see that the TNF-alpha and the interferon gamma, that they are prior to treatment elevated and they are they reduce to normal levels after treatment. So this was very strong evidence that it helps to bring down these elevated uh, inflammatory markers. And this was the basis for uh, studies um, looking at the uh, effectiveness of immunoglobulins. Uh, in randomized studies, there have been three uh, studies performed over the years. Um, in 2006, published study from uh, Sweden, in uh, 2007 from Norway, and in 2013 from Italy. And the studies um, um, all did a randomized uh, controlled trial. Now we looked at the effectiveness of all uh, interventions in, uh, for postpartum syndrome. We wrote it in a Cochrane uh, review, uh, as I said earlier, over 100 pages. Never do it again, but we did it. And um, we um, looked, we pre specified in this uh, Cochrane review because that's the way it works. You have to pre uh, define what your primary outcome is that you're going to look at for effectiveness. Otherwise, you can say, well, we just look at everything, and if we just find something, then that's important. So they, now they say you really have to predetermine what you're going to look at. And we discussed and we found the most relevant outcome um, and also what we would expect in many studies uh, oh, that we should look at activity limitations that people would, that it would improve their functioning. And then you're allowed to include five secondary outcome parameters in your review of one which should be uh, adverse events. So that leaves four others. And there we took uh, the major postpolio syndrome symptoms. What does it do on muscle strength, on muscle endurance, on fatigue, and on pain? Then you do a assessment of all the studies with respect to their methodological quality. How well is this study executed? And that is also very strict. And based on this uh, assessment of the study quality, you can um, categorize your studies as high quality to very low quality evidence. And of course, what does it mean, high to, to low? Well, high means that further research is very unlikely to change uh, your uh, findings. And of course here you make, uh, they say it more specific, the confidence in the estimate of the effect because in a, in a review of more studies you can make uh, a uh, calculation of the pooled effect of different studies. Well, this is all methodological language not too important. But for instance, low quality and very low quality, that's important that further research is very likely to have an important impact on your conclusion. So that may change what you were, you have found in the study so far, a new study. And very low quality, uh, then you really have a very big doubt whether or not there is these studies really show an effect. So you go from high to low quality. If you find high quality in the, in the literature so far, then there's no need to do a new study and otherwise you are well, um, there's a good motivation to do another study. Um, 
Now, the three trials, here are some characteristics. This is the number of patients involved, and these were in total 212 patients randomized over the three studies. Here you see the treatment. Also, differences in studies. Uh, the study by Gonzalez and Borg gave one, uh, two times with a three-month interval a dose of 90 grams, and the others all gave two grams per kilogram for one time and then looked at the effect. What were the uh, conclusions from uh, uh, the uh, uh, findings uh, and looking at the methodological quality of the study? studies? There was moderate and low quality evidence that immunoglobulins had no beneficial effect on activity limitations or primary outcome in the short and in the long term, respectively. So moderate for the short term and low for the long term, because that was less than the three studies. Not all studies reported on the long term outcome. Effects on muscle strength were inconsistent. The study from, from Gonzalez found a significant effect on muscle strength. The other two studies did not. Um, so this was not consistent. And if you <coughs> looked at the pooled effects or on uh, the other outcomes uh, on pain, also on activity limitation and fatigue, uh, there was no effect. I will show you some of that. And there were minor side effects in a substantial proportion of uh, uh, patients. So uh, many experienced some side effects of the treatment, but not really uh, significant. Now here is, for instance, uh, it's a quite uh, difficult to read slide, but this is how it works in a Cochrane review, that you look at the effect. Uh, the line is no effect, and if th this um, figure is outside, has no contact with the line, then there is a significant effect because that gives the confidence interval around the effect. And here you see, this is for activity limitations, short-term effect, uh, measured with a short form 36 physical component uh, score uh, summary. And you see that in the study from Gonzalez, there was uh, no effect, just not almost on the edge, but it was just not significant. And in the study from Italy, there was no effect. So in total, over the studies, a pooled analysis so you have to have access to the original data, which we collected from the different uh, uh, people involved in the study. We found just no effect on activity limitation. The third study did not use activity limitation as an outcome. And then the next that I want to show, is, oh yeah, so here you see just not an effect. This is uh, a slide that gives you the results on the outcome of pain me measured with a visual analog scale. And you see in the study from Gonzalez, no effect. In the study from Bertolazzi, no, no effect. And the study from Farbu, which included only 10 patients uh, uh, with an intervention versus 10 controls. This is a small study. Gave a significant effect on pain, but if you did pull the data to a combined analysis, there was no effect on pain, no significant effect. So here again, you see that one study gave a significant effect, but if you combine the result, there's no summarized effect. So the next thing is that now we know that it's moderate and low quality for lack of effectiveness, um, uh, according to this interpretation of this grading, there, uh, if you do a new study, that could change your conclusion, and that has been uh, an um, important uh, uh, reason uh, to, to continue uh, studies. Uh, and if you look at whether or not you should decide on a new study, you have to look at how has, have been studies been done, and could a different, a new study be, should it be done differently to 
maybe get a better result. And what uh, you can see in these uh, three studies that they gave a single or a double dose, two studies, a single dose, and one study gave a double dose. They looked at short-term outcome over a period of three months, while progression of the muscle weakness in post-polio syndrome is very slow. So if you want to measure an effect on a very slowly progressive disease, if, if your study duration is short, it will be quite difficult to find an effect. Um, as I said, the quality of the evidence was low, and on some aspects, some outcomes, the results were inconsistent, uh, especially regarding the muscle strength. So there's at this moment a new study ongoing. That's the FORCE trial, a study initiated by Griffels. And here the primary efficacy objective is to demonstrate an effect on uh, walking in a two-minute uh, walking test, um, whether it should be an improvement or a slowing down of progression compared to the control group uh, in physical performance. And the intervention in this study is uh, given every four weeks over a period of one year. So that's a much longer intervention period and also more repeated uh, treatments. And the secondary uh, efficacy uh, objectives are to look at the clinical effect on pain, on health-related quality of life, the, the physical component score again, of this SF36, and improving or slow, slowing of uh, the progression of uh, uh, decline in endurance. Um, and that's measured with a six minute walking test. Also, there's a safety objective to, to look at the safety and tolerability of two separate doses. One is uh, two grams per kilogram and the other is one gram per kilogram. So it's a three-armed uh, study, in fact. And here you see the study design. It's a combined phase two and phase uh, three uh, study. In the phase two, there is uh, <coughs> the, the optimal uh, um, dosage uh, phase and also looking at the um, uh, safety uh, outcomes. And here you can be randomized either to placebo or the two gram or one gram per kilogram uh, uh, dosage. And then after phase two, phase three, we'll look at the efficacy with the optimized uh, dosage, which came, comes out from the first stage, and that will look at the effect. In total, there will be 210 patients randomized over the whole study, 126 in the first part, 84 in the second. So that's a large uh, uh, number. And here you see the, the, the study duration for both phases. It will be a screening period of four weeks and a treatment period of a year. And then a final follow-up will be 24 weeks after last uh, infusion. And at present, 86 out of the 126 patients required for the first stage are randomized. And here you also see that the countries involved and the number of sites. So it's a, it's a multi-center uh, international study. Well, uh, my last slide. Um, there is evidence for chronic inflammation in post-polio syndrome that may play a role in the pathogenesis. The, the relation with the progression over time is not yet clarified. Um, the trials that have been done were three trials, two small one, one big one, no final conclusive evidence, and there's now a new trial going on uh, which has a more uh, yeah, strong intervention also over a longer period of time. So I think this is the trial that should prove or refute whether or not immunoglobulins are effective in uh, treating post syndrome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nolan.